All right, we have a lot to talk about today. Some connections to the founding of America and European royal families. Basically, the Catholics had so much political control, they forced entire histories underground, creating secret societies and royal collusions between families, leading to secret voyages to America that could have been going on as far back as the 11th century. I'm talking about the theory that the Knights Templar, led by Henry Sinclair, visited North America in the late 1300s. This is an idea that a lot of scholars have theorized about. There's actually even a monument commemorating their voyage in Canada. And the Sinclair and Masonic people to this day theorize about this alleged journey taken by their predecessors. So let's get into it. First, let's start way back with the Vikings. And we know that the term Viking is equivalent to something like a pirate. Vikings were just sea raiders that pillaged around Europe. What we're really talking about is the wider Scandinavian people as a whole. The Norwegian specifically, but it encompasses all of Northern Europe and their descendants in places like Scotland, France, and Germany. We know of the Norse voyage exploring Greenland and the archaeological record shows they made it as far as Northern Canada in the New Finland region and explored and traveled around that area around 1000 AD. We have their oral histories recorded in what is now known as the Sagas of the Greenlanders and the Sagas of the Icelanders. Unfortunately, the Nordic people were not ones for map making. They preferred to go by memory and landmarks or navigating using celestial bodies. However though, word of their exploits spread fast throughout the Scandinavian world. Anybody who spoke the language or practiced their old religions or simply grew up with a Scandinavian background would have been told these stories. The TV show Vikings really depicts this detail well, how the Scandinavian people spread stories of Viking exploits quickly, and how the Vikings are people that seek fame and want to live on in the stories later written down as the Viking sagas. These stories, much like the Nordic people and the culture, would have slowly trickled down to the people they conquered or settled near, like in Denmark, Scotland, Northern Germany, and Normandy. I believe that by the time the sagas were written down in the 1200s, the people living in these regions of Northern Europe would have already known them by memory. These were the stories they would have grown up hearing from friends, family, relatives, and even in church because paganism at this time was mixing with Christianity in these regions. And when these documents were finally written down, they were done so in the old Norwegian language they spoke during this time period in the 13th century. This is where the Sinclair family comes in. Specifically Henry Sinclair, who was a nobleman of Scottish and Norwegian descent. This means he came from nobility and was close to the royal families in Europe. The King of Norway at this time appointed him Earl of Orkney in 1379, which is an island just off the northern coast of Scotland. Not only did this man speak the language the sagas were written in a century earlier, but he had also grown up hearing the stories of Leif Erikson and the voyages to the New World as a child from his father and grandfather. Once stories like that of the expedition of Leif Erikson to Vinland get into the public sphere, it only takes so long before somebody with the proper means and abilities will go out and find it himself. We're also not sure how long the Vinland colony was even in use for. We know the story took place around 1000 AD and carbon dating at Lonzo Meadows site gives us dates around 1090, but there's no agreed upon date of when the Vikings let this site fall into disrepair. There's evidence showing that the natives around northern Canada were still receiving goods from the Norse as late as 1400s, leading many scholars to believe that the Norwegians were still in contact and trading with those in Vinland at this time. And we also know they stayed in Greenland as late as the 15th century as well. So the Norwegians had the means of making this voyage to the New World during the life of Henry Sinclair and were most likely exploring the greater North America. They could have made it as far as South America or even Alaska in those 450 years between the founding of Vinland and the abandonment of their settlements in Greenland. But that's a topic for a later video which we'll definitely get into eventually. Anyway, Henry Sinclair was a very powerful man in this part of Europe. His wealth at this time would have been equivalent to today's billionaires. He lived in castles and had many properties and ships. He was also known as the Admiral of the Seas, a title he got while in service to Scotland. Now, by this time we're talking somewhere in the mid-1300s. The Knights Templar had been forced underground by Pope Clement V, declaring them a heretical group, and Philip IV sent his army to arrest and torture them for practicing Satanism from 1307 to 1314. But much like any super wealthy organization, you cannot fully destroy them by making their practice illegal. They'll simply go underground, and that's how we got so much secrecy during these times. After the Templars were mostly rounded up, they lacked a home base. So being the powerful organization that they were, they had to find asylum somewhere in another country that shared their disdain for the Pope and the Catholic royals. Most people theorize that the Templars escaped to Scotland. Coincidentally, the same place Freemasonry later came from in the 18th century. Now, we need to talk about the Cistercian connection because Henry Sinclair was probably the most powerful Cistercian. 
He grew up with the teachings from the Cistercian monks and no doubt identified with the collective. The Knights Templar were also very closely tied to these Cistercian monks. Apparently when a Templar Knight was disbanded for whatever reason, they would live out their lives as a monk in a Cistercian monastery. It would have been easy for them to renounce their Templar ties when it became illegal and disguise themselves as these Cistercian monks and make their way to Scotland where they were being housed by the Sinclair family and the Scottish royals. During this time from 1306 to 1329, the ruler of Scotland was Robert the Bruce. And if you're not familiar with his story, he was not liked by the Pope at this time either. In fact, he was excommunicated for murdering another Scottish nobleman by the name of John Common in 1306. And when the people made him King of Scots shortly thereafter, the Pope excommunicated all of Scotland from the Catholic Church. This made him an obvious ally for the Knights Templar. And there's also a weird story of a battle in Scotland known as the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, where the Scottish army was greatly outnumbered and unknown cavalry outflanked the enemy and won the battle for the Scots. Many people theorize that this unknown cavalry was the remnants of the Knights Templar. Anyway, scholars mostly agree that Scotland would have been the perfect place of refuge for these outlawed knights, and it seems that Robert the Bruce even may have commissioned them for war. And Henry Sinclair, with all his wealth and castles, assisted in the harboring of these Templar, and all this was lost to history due to what ramifications of hiding such a group would have brought to this royal bloodline during the time. If that's not enough evidence connecting the underground Knights Templar to Henry Sinclair, then you'll want to take a look at the architecture left behind by his family. First off, these castles look very similar to earlier sites the Templar created, and we know the Templar were masters at creating huge, extravagant castles and architecture. And then we have the absolute smoking gun connecting Henry Sinclair to the Norwegian pagan traditions and the Knights Templar all in one building, the Roslyn Chapel, built by the grandson of Henry Sinclair, displays indisputable Knights Templar symbolism as well as pagan deities showing their family's Viking origins. So this man Henry Sinclair was very in touch with his Nordic pagan roots, still understanding the symbolism used by his ancestors, and had clear connections to the Knights Templar through these Cistercian monks. Now the Templars knew they couldn't stay in Scotland forever and they also had a huge amount of wealth that has never been accounted for. This was in the form of money from their banking exploits and also what they have pillaged during their crusades and missions. But most importantly, they were said to have historical artifacts found in the Holy Land like the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, the Spear of Destiny, the Temple Menorah, and who knows what else. We know they built huge tunnels in and under the Temple Mount searching for treasures, and they were hoarding much of Europe's wealth at their peak. This vast amount of money and holy artifacts could not stay in Scotland and it had to be hidden somewhere. Many theorize it may still be in Scotland somewhere, or even Portugal, another potential country the Templars escaped to, but others say they brought it to America and only a Norwegian nobleman with knowledge from his ancestors and connection to the King of Norway could have known how to get there without dying or being swept away in the wrong currents. Like we found earlier, the Norwegians could have still been traveling back and forth from Canada at this time. They were for sure still traveling to Greenland. The Norwegians could have literally secretly shuttled the Templars led by Henry Sinclair to America and kept it hidden due to potential repercussions from kingdoms that followed the Pope like France. Either this or Sinclair could have used his experience as an admiral and his many ships to sail the knights and their wealth westward like the stories of his youth told him Leif Erikson did. There's also a story written in 1558 by a Venetian nobleman named Niccolo Zeno, a historian who published many Venetian histories including one about his family sailing to America in 1390. To make this journey they were said to have an old Norwegian map shown here. Polo said to have based his story off letters his family had sent him as a child. This map brings up a lot of debate as it shows several islands that are considered mythical and modern maps show don't exist. Some theorize that either they were mistaken in trying to depict Greenland or the Faroe Islands, or that possibly rising sea levels eventually led to the sinking of these islands sometime in the last 500 years. Basically, due to these so-called phantom islands, scholars discount this story entirely, but many theories state that this story details the voyage of Henry Sinclair. In the story, two members of the Zeno family voyage with a man named Prince Zygmini and his men, who was believed to possibly be a secret name for Henry Sinclair. In the story, the brothers and the prince travel across the Scandinavian region to Iceland, the phantom island of Friesland, and eventually to a land to the west called Estotiland and Drogio. They detail this land as full of cannibals and strange animals they'd never seen before, and they eventually come to a place with good soil where they build a settlement and eventually the Zeno brothers return home, leaving Prince Zygmini and his men behind. This story is very reminiscent of the Henry Sinclair story. There's also a weird fact I found stating that the death of Henry Sinclair was a mystery. 
The explanation goes that he dies sometime between 1404 and 1412, and they say that he was, quote, possibly killed in battle against English seamen. But all I hear when they say that is that he was killed at sea, or maybe he just never returned from a sea voyage. I would also like to point out the Venetian connection here, if the Zeno Brothers story is about Henry Sinclair. Which I really think it is, and I encourage you to look it up and read it yourself. Maybe I'll even make a video about it in the future, but the Venetians were a very wealthy and powerful people in medieval Europe. They were also masters of symbolism similar to what we see at the Roslyn Chapel. So we have our means for Henry Sinclair to make it to America, and we have our motive, i.e. the treasure and huge amounts of money, and he has knowledge and wealth to make the journey happen. He also has the connections to the Norwegians who were still in Greenland and Iceland and possibly other places too at the time. But what did they do in America? What did they leave behind? First I'd like to show you is a site called Newport Tower. Now there's several of these old world towers around the east coast and there's always a story behind them and how they were built but it never really adds up. This one they claim was built in the 16th century by Dutch immigrants as a windmill. This is a Dutch windmill. This is the Newport Tower. It's not a windmill. This tower has extremely precise alignments, illuminating one egg-shaped stone on the winter solstice by letting just the right amount of light in through the window at the specific time of day. It also has this weird red cornerstone that's put in such a specific place, and it would have never been done so on purpose when building a tower unless it was there for a specific reason. Some speculate that this tower was built as a marker or some kind of compass directing settlers where to go, possibly pointing towards some kind of treasure or early Templar settlement. And there are several of these towers. Another piece of evidence the Templars were in America is the flag flown by the Mi'kmaq people. These people would have resided on the east coast of Canada and the northeast United States during the 14th century, and this flag has clear inspirations from a Templar-related group and could not have been created without some kind of outside influence from this time in Europe. The symbols on this flag are very old symbols shown in many European royal crests, as well as the obvious red cross on a white background like the Templars and other related groups wear. I would also like to point out that in the Zeno Brothers story, they became friends with the cannibals and taught them how to fish and most likely traded with them too, possibly giving them this flag they based this one off of. The Mi'kmaq and other tribes in this area also have a legend of a man named Glooskap, who came to their land and helped them build their civilization, and some equate this figure to the story of Henry Sinclair. But the most compelling evidence the Templars traded with the Mi'kmaq people is at the Overton Stone in Nova Scotia. This stone to me depicts a peace agreement between two civilizations that could not speak each other's language. It looks like something that would happen at first contact. You see what is clearly a Templar cross and next to it with the same level of erosion is a Mi'kmaq symbol. Imagine the Mi'kmaq people see huge boats with red crosses pull up to their shores and people get out of the boat and carve a symbol into the rock and then return to their boats. The Mi'kmaq people then carve their symbol next to it to signify they want to have a peaceful introduction. This leads me to the next piece of evidence the Templars were in America, and is what the guys on the TV show Curse of Oak Island are finding on that island in Nova Scotia. First of all, Nova Scotia was founded by the Scots in 1497, suspiciously very shortly after Columbus discovered America. One might think they had stories of previous voyages to go off of. Anyway, on Oak Island, if you're not familiar, they found all kinds of stuff that point to Templars. The cross symbolism, as well as the man-made triangle swamp. They literally found a lead cross that was mined in the 12th century in France and symbolism on a match is those found in Templar caves in England. This cross was also found to be a functional compass and was discovered under an old dock just off the coast of Oak Island. They also found what looks to be shredded pieces of stylized metal including more lead pieces and gold. I personally think that if this Templar mystery is going to be solved definitively, it's going to be through the work they're doing on Oak Island. We know that the Templars built massive underground tunnel systems, and they even built a sort of hole in Portugal that has the same exact dimensions as the money pit on Oak Island. So I really think there's something to be found there, possibly Templar treasure and artifacts. Lastly, I want to talk about one more connection. There have been a number of runic inscriptions found in America, mostly in the same area we've been discussing. These stones are said to not be contemporary with other runic inscriptions found across Scandinavia. I found this guy Scott Walter who used to have this show on History Channel called America Unearthed and he studied these rune stones more than anybody else. I put his video in the description if you want to check it out, but basically he concluded that these runes were sort of a secret code based off the runic language, but with some different details in the way they were written. I'm not an expert by any means, but basically he found that some of these runes are written in a specific way and it's consistent across all these stones in America. 
The most interesting part of these American rune stones is there's this one rune that's found on no other rune anywhere in the world except for these stones in America, and it's the Hooked X. This Hooked X is found in only one other place other than these rune stones in America, and that's at Roslyn Chapel in England, built by the grandson of Henry Sinclair. There's also engravings of New World plants like corn and three-petaled trillium flower which is only found in North America at Roslyn Chapel. Basically, William Sinclair built this chapel to display his family's true knowledge and accomplishments for those who are in the know to see. But what does all this mean? It means that it's entirely possible that in North America lies untold treasures, artifacts, or even ruins left by the Knights Templar in the 1300s. Alright, that's all I have for you right now. Thank you so much if you made it to the end. If you want to go further down the rabbit hole, I put some good videos to check out in the description. A lot of work and research went into this video, so do me a favor and hit the like button and leave me a comment with your thoughts on these theories. This has been Tales of the Old World. Thank you for watching.